Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our monthly webinar organized by IEEE's Instrumentation and Future Technologies Committee. Uh, today's speaker is Matthew Fladlin from NASA Ames Research Center. He'll be speaking to us about current high altitude platform systems capable of supporting NASA Earth Science, as well as outlining current NASA projects that are seeking to mature and exploit these platforms. He is currently a research scientist managing several teams in the Ames Earth Science Division and that provides agency-wide engineering and IT support to flight projects, new technology and planning, as well as contracting for aviation services. We ask that you please hold your questions until the end, but if needed, please feel free to put your question in the chat or QA box. But again, we will wait until the end to answer the questions. And with that, we look forward to Matt Sock. Please take it away, Matthew. All right, thanks so much, Sean. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys all about uh, the latest developments in uh, high altitude platform systems. This is a really exciting part of aeronautics and uh, uh, what we see as an important new element to a uh, future Earth observing system architecture that NASA is working on. So if you go to the next slide, I just have a little intro slide on myself, but Sean did a great job on, on that. Um, so I'm an airborne science manager. I run a program office for headquarters out of Ames Research Center. And so we're in charge of cross-cutting uh, engineering across our, our fleet of aircraft that I'll show later. And then I'm also responsible for new technology development. And so that's uh, done primarily through our small business innovative research program. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. To the right are some of the platforms that I've been involved with over the years uh, from design all the way through to flight testing and operations. Uh, so today we're going to talk about kind of this new class of aircraft um, called called high altitude platform systems or HAIL UAS. Um, and so let's go to the next one. This is just a, a quick outline. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this NASA Earth System Observatory is going to be. Um, then we'll talk about some of the science requirements for HAPS, what the platform capabilities are a few demonstration projects that we're working on or just completed, and then some of the technology uh, development that NASA is investing in to ensure that these platforms provide science measurements for us. Next one. So this is a what we call our spiral chart, and this is uh, a way to showcase all of the NASA uh, satellites that are either uh, have been on orbit, are on orbit, or planned. And I, and I guess the, the reason I put this up is just to show this, the scale and scope of NASA's uh, Earth Science Division assets currently in space. Um, so let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so for, for each of these satellites, aircraft have played a really important role uh, from pretty much the conception all the way to operations. Um, what I'm showing here is the different vantage points that NASA uses in order to study the Earth, and it's really important that these, these uh, vantage points be integrated. Um, that's partly what the dashed lines are showing, is the communications and, and telemetry um, between these different vantage points. So in this case, aircraft are, are really important for testing new sensors, for underflying satellites after we launch them to do calibration and validation, as well as to support process studies where we use satellite data, ground data, aircraft data to really resolve uncertainties in Earth system models, whether it's hurricane intensification or it's uh, volcanic plume modeling and uh, the, chem the chemical effects of, of uh, aging plumes. Uh, aircraft play a really important role. What we're talking about today is really a new class of aircraft that kind of uh, blends the, the properties of satellites and aircraft uh, to provide uh, essentially a, a watchtower in the sky for weeks to months at a time. And so it's similar in some sense to a geostationary satellite because we can kind of sit over a target and watch things change over time. But obviously it's like an aircraft where it can, it can come up and down, we can replace the payloads and update them as needed so it provides that additional flexibility. Next slide, please. Uh, another really important element to the Earth System Observatory is this, this cycle of taking foundational knowledge, uh, working on uh, both science problems and applied research, coming up with solutions that uh, can essentially benefit society, and then making sure that we're making these results known to the, to, to the greater public. 
so that they can make decisions as to how they're managing things. And then the idea is that that's a, a, a virtuous cycle where we get new requirements, new observations, and, and ultimately help solve some of the nation's uh, ch most challenging problems with earth science data. Um, and you'll see that HAPs play a really big role in that. Next. So within NASA, we have a lot of different what, what people refer to as stovepipes. Uh, but in this case, I, I think that it's different parts of the agency that are working together and really emphasizing the things that, that they do best within each of their elements uh, in order to move high altitude platform systems forward. So I'm talking to you from the Science Mission Directorate, Earth Science Division. And within that, we have the Earth Science Technology Office. And they, they fund the development of new instruments, new software, new components. Uh, traditionally, it's been for satellites, but more recently, they have been investing in HAPS. Uh, within uh, the NASA Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, the Upper E Traffic Management Project is working with the FAA to apply uncrewed traffic management principles that were developed for small UAS and apply those to Upper E uh, airspace. This is 60,000 feet and above. So that's a really important part of what we hope to do with these systems. Unless we can get them into the airspace, they're not of much use to us. So it's really important that we're working with our ARMD colleagues and the FAA. Uh, the Space Technology Mission Directorate, uh, the Flight Opportunities Program. If you're not aware of that, definitely look into that because it's a, it's a program that NASA funds researchers to get access to very unique assets like uh, some of these commercial space planes or sounding rockets and more recently high altitude platforms. Finally, I mentioned it earlier, but the Small Business Innovative Research Program is a really important tool that uh, a lot of the research agencies have uh, in order to spur uh, development in new technologies, convey requirements to small companies as to what the different agencies are looking for, and, and ultimately to seed new technologies. Next slide. So this is our uh, current fleet of, of aircraft uh, that we use to support our science community uh, for the development of instruments and, and for process studies, like I mentioned before. Uh, what you note here is these are all crewed aircraft. Um, NASA in the past has um, worked to develop and mature and operate the Global Hawk, the Predator. We also have the Sierra. But over time, um, it's it's those have been proven to be very difficult assets to manage both because of air, airspace integration but also the cost and so um what you'll notice is we don't have those in our fleet anymore these are a crude aircraft um if you go to the next chart it's it's one way to look at how um the the, the aircraft performance and, and capabilities can meet our, our science needs so on the bottom there is is endurance in hours and then you have max altitude but it shows a nice spread right we have lots of different requirements for taking measurements at the surface of the ocean all the way up to 60,000 feet. And so you can see here that these, this, this fleet complements uh, each other in terms of being able to cover a, a wide variety of requirements, uh, have different range, and have different useful payload capacity. But keep an eye on that, that bottom endurance one. If we go to the next chart now. Now, this is a, we had a series of workshops after our ERAS program. Uh, this was a program with aeronautics to develop um, the Helios and Pathfinder series, the, the solar electric planes. Uh, but really, we went out to the community in a series of workshops to explore the use of uncrewed aircraft systems of all types for science. And this was um, a, a bunch of data that we pulled together from those inputs. Now, if you look at the endurance in hours here, it's a log scale. So we go from 10 hours in that lower part to 100 or 1,000 hours. So if you think back to what I just showed you, the airplanes that we currently have really can only capture that lower left portion of, of these science targets. That leaves a lot of science that we just can't do right now with our satellites or with our traditional aircraft. And so that's partly why, why we're doing what we're doing, is we want to expand the scope um, of, of, and, and the ability of our aircraft to be able to get at some of these science targets, whether it's stratospheric ozone, uh, pollution tracking, improved weather forecasting. Uh, the other thing to note here is these blue dots over here, that, that, that indicates areas where we need vertical profiling. So dropping drops on or taking um, microwave or radar or LIDAR measurements. So let's go to the next one. So recently um, our, our fleet is, is, is aging. Uh, you know, you don't see a whole lot of U-2s and ER-2s out there. Our DC-8 aircraft um, was 
it was essentially end of end of life as of uh, this this calendar year. So a few few years back, NASA went to the National Academies and, and asked them to do a study, um, partly to, to to look at whether we should replace our uh, DC-8, but also just to look more broadly across all the different capabilities and, and get a, a sense for where airborne science should be going in the future. So what I've done is I've excerpted here a, a few paragraphs that I think are relevant to this discussion. The, uh, the National Academy has rightly pointed out the, 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 the capabilities of these long duration UAS and how important they can be for, for taking measurements um, of, in this case, hurricanes and cyclones. Um, but you'll notice in this last bolded uh, element here, the idea that these are still not mature, that it's that and they forecasted it would take about a decade before these things would be uh, ready to go and ready to support science. So um, I remember when this was released and I remember reading that and, and I really took it as marching orders that, you know, hey, we need we need to do a better job here of uh, working with companies, working within the different agencies and, and helping to move this technology forward because it's so important and it has the potential to really uh, provide measurements that we just can't get any other way. Next slide. Another uh, impetus for this work is um, an, a, a decadal survey recommended. So this National Academies does a decadal survey. Every 10 years, they um, get inputs from the community and provide guidance to NASA on uh, what we should be focusing our resources on, uh, typically related to satellite missions. Well, for the first time, um, we have a future satellite mission that's an incubation right now, meaning it needs um, more technology to mature it. But uh, so this is a JPL led team uh, that's working to essentially fuse radar, LIDAR and stereo imaging to provide a, a 4D map of the earth uh, structurally. So uh, land surface, vegetation surface and structure, and then also watching that change. Um, so as they've been formulating this, it's, it's clear to this team that HAPS um, will play a really important role in their architecture. So this is actually the first NASA satellite mission of, of record that is considering HAPS as, an, as a, a fundamental part of the architecture alongside the satellites. And what I've bolded here are, again, excerpts from this, the incubation study report, really looking at the importance of this high resolution, uh, high, high spatial and high temporal resolution measurements that are needed to, to be able to uh, complement satellites. So there'll be an overpass, but then a lot of cool things are gonna happen and we're gonna want something that's up there taking these measurements, whether it's landslides, whether it's uh, you know post earthquakes uh, 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 fracturing, or, or it's volcanic um, emissions or deformation. So on the next next slide here, there's another way to look at this. Um, this is taken out of that report, but what you'll see in that kind of shaded area is, is a measurement gap. Um, you'll see that there's uh, co-seismic rupturing that we maybe can't capture at some of the time scales that are needed. Uh, you'll see uh, millimeter all the way to kilometer on the bottom there, sorry, and then on the, on the left is the time scale. Uh, but you, you can see distributed deformation, fracturing, faulting, post-seismic fault slip. So that, that gray murky area is, is where HAPs uh, are going to help us. It, it's essentially the area, both in, in, in space and time, that the satellites can't currently capture, that current aircraft systems can't capture. Uh, so that's the gap we're trying to fill, is really in those hours, seconds to months, and in from centimeters to uh, meter resolution. Next slide. This is yet another way to kind of look at these capabilities uh, compared to, uh, in this case, this is kind of the, the spectrum of uncrewed systems that are available out there. So in the in the bottom left, you see like the, the DJI Matrice 600 or the Alta X or Alta 8. Um, again, this is a log scale. So, and then as you go to the right, there's the Sierra or Viking. Those are like 500 pound aircraft that can fly for about 10 hours. And then as you go over, you have the Predator B, you have the Global Hawk, and then as you move to the right, you have some of these solar electric fixed wings and the larger solar uh, capabilities. But as you can see, it's it's a it, it has significantly larger range. Uh, it's able they loiter up at, at sixty thousand feet for essentially weeks to months at a time. But the one thing you'll note too, uh, the the gray box represents useful payload. They do not have very high payload. And so that has, it, that it has been a limiting factor in terms of the utility of these systems for many, many years. Um, if you go to the next one, uh, 
So I'm going to start talking about some of the platforms that we're working on here. Um, this is a company called Swift Engineering down in San Clemente. They were first funded in 2017 under a phase one SBIR. They were then awarded a phase two to actually uh, build and prototype and test this vehicle. Uh, I think, you know, for this project, the timing was kind of rough. As everybody knows, 2020 and 2021 were rough years to, to do a lot of field work. Uh, but the team uh, has made a lot of accomplishments recently. Um, as you'll see, this is a 175 pound aircraft but it's 72 feet long wingspan. So what that tells you is, is it's got very lightweight yet strong structures. It's got solar panels all, all along the tops of the wings. The spar is filled with batteries. And so essentially the, the, the way this thing flies is it, it uh, ascends for about eight to 10 hours from the ground up to 60,000 feet. And then it charges its batteries during the day, taking measurements. And then at night, it slowly drifts down from about 65,000 feet to 50,000 feet. And then when the sun comes up, it starts charging the batteries again and climbs. So that it, it essentially uh, takes that um, that con op day by day. And and can it's this design was originally for 30 days, but with the newest generation of batteries, the team thinks that they can get up to 100 days. And it carries uh, 15 up to 15 pounds in that little nose cone. If you go to the next one. So you'll note the timestamp on here. So this was just a few days ago, but um, I guess all I can say at this point is that uh, you can expect some really good news from this team uh, next week. They, they had a very exciting flight uh, Sunday, Monday. And uh, that's about all I can say right now because they haven't put out their press release. But what you'll see here are uh, pictures from the uh, tail camera looking forward with a wide field of view uh, camera. And at the bottom is the team that's, uh, that was deployed at Spaceport uh, down in New Mexico. That's where they're flying because they have restricted airspace down there. Next one. So uh, this is the next step in the evolution of this platform, and that this uh, is a mission that the Forest Service is funding. So we're partnering with NIFSI, essentially to deploy this uh, in a situation that mimics a fire. Uh, given our airspace constraints, where we can only fly in restricted airspace at this time, the, the idea here is to be able to demonstrate the ability of, of this platform to carry a multi-camera payload uh, and to essentially loiter over a fire and provide high resolution, uh, low latency data to fire managers. And so this is actually uh, slated to still fly this month. We have a flight readiness review uh, next Thursday, and then uh, we're just waiting for the weather to line up in order for us to be able to launch uh, the vehicle in spaceport. We'll set up some hot targets on the ground uh, to characterize the, the geopositioning error and the and the, and the general response of the of the camera for different uh, heat sources, but we're really excited to see this uh, this aircraft uh, essentially become a, a, an operational asset in a, in a tool in, in the toolkit for firefighters across the country. Next one. So the other platform that we've been exploring with the Forest Service is the Thunderhead um, uh, high capacity high altitude balloon. Um, as I think. People understand a lot of the wildland fires that we have happen uh, far away from communities, uh, oftentimes in mountain ranges or steep valleys where there's just no connectivity. And so an, an important element of setting up an incident command is, is setting up communications networking. And that's really difficult to do in, in some of these large areas where there's lots of topographic relief. And so uh, several years ago, um, when there was a, I think it was called the Moose Fire, it was here in the Western US, <laughs> Uh, our friends at NIFSI called me up and asked, uh, said that they were looking at FlightAware and there was some aircraft that was 60,000 feet above their fire and it was just sitting there stationary. So they asked me, hey, Matt, is that one of NASA's planes? And I said, no, you know, our planes go pretty fast. And so they would be moving over that scene and then they'd, they'd be gone. So I, I had an idea of who that might be. And we called up Aerostar and sure enough, they were doing an internal research and development flight over the fire to test how these balloons might provide last mile calm as well as imagery. So a little bit on these balloons. Um, these balloons were uh, originally developed as part of a partnership with Google X, which is the experimental part of Google. And they had a project called Loon. And the, uh, the objective of that was to use uh, station keeping balloons to provide 
Wi-Fi connectivity or cell coverage to remote areas. And you may remember a hurricane in Puerto Rico where these were deployed in a constellation and provided uh, that sort of data services to Puerto Rico. Well, Loon ended up uh, going back into Google X. It didn't spin off as a company, but Aerostar um, essentially took a lot of the uh, intellectual property that came out of that and has wor worked towards commercializing this capability. And what makes this asset so unique is that it is essentially a, a, a navigation takes place through very precise uh, knowledge and prediction of upper level winds. And so when you're up at 65,000 feet, if you can, if you drop 5,000 feet, the winds can go in a completely different direction. And so what this balloon does is it's continually changing altitude to find the winds that will carry it where you want it to go. So in the case of this mission, let's go to the next slide. We set up a balloon over a fire and we put a Silvis, uh, or sorry, uh, we, we had both a line of sight backhaul for, for internet service as well as Starlink. Um, but the idea being that the balloon uh, has a gimbal to provide the LTE coverage and you tell the balloon that you want the gimbal put on this spot and then the balloon will change altitude, move all around, but still point that beam where you need it to go. And what, we're, what we found is that the, uh, the balloon was able to stay within about 20 miles of, of a site that you need. And it provided uh, connectivity within about a 10 mile bubble and then was able to provide imagery. We were able to set up Wi-Fi networks. So if you go to the next one, it shows some of the, the accomplishments from that mission. So we were able to evaluate the capabilities of the platform. Uh, we assessed integration and engineering, as well as the payload uh, size, weight, and power characteristics that it can accommodate. Uh, we showed the ability to send and receive data to a remote fire. We were able to track and display the information in our open source framework, mission tool suite. And then we actually were also able to export that into the uh, tactical awareness kits or TAC that are used by the, the people on the ground actually that are working on the fire. So we think this was a very successful mission. So does the Forest Service. And uh, we're looking at now planning a Strato 2 uh, next year uh, that would in, in, uh, engage uh, additional assets. So one of the things, it was a 14 day flight mission during, uh, I, I think about nine days in, the, the wind diversity change, that's what they call it when they're when they don't have the types of winds that they need to, to stay in place. And so the, 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 the platform moved down south away from the fires for a couple days. And that really highlighted the, the need to have uh, more than one up there. Uh, and Aerostar, is, it was very clear about that with us, that the more balloons you have, the more uh, measurements you have of upper level winds and the better uh, the autopilot does at uh, maintaining their, their uh, station keeping. So that's that's the next plan here is to deploy multiple balloons to uh, have broader area coverage, but also to ensure that we can have persistent coverage uh, even when the, the winds change. The other, I guess one last thing I'll say about this is just in terms of the uh, the swap, the uh, the gondola of this version of the balloon, the, the entire gondola with uh, payload and with networking and environmental uh, controls was about 120 pounds. The next version of the Thunderhead balloon, I believe, is going to be 200 plus pounds. So we're looking forward to uh, to seeing that. All right, let's go to the next one. So as I mentioned, one of the ways that NASA conveys its requirements to the community and 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 seed seed funds uh, commun uh, the the commercial sector uh, to develop the types of platforms that we need is through SBIR. So back in 2022, we funded uh, these five phase ones. Um, you'll note one of them is a small UAS, but the uh, the idea here was that this was about persistence and being able to fly continuously for many, many days. And so, um, but uh, you'll see that the, the Sky Dweller, that was a variant of that crewed aircraft that did an around the world flight. Uh, you can see the, the Swift uh, Sewell 2 um, and then the, uh, the Sakos uh, by Electra. Uh, if you go to the next one. So what happens is these are phase one proposals. They, they, um, they do a study for six months and then they propose for a two to three year million dollar study. And so from those, uh, from that cohort of phase ones, uh, we ended up selecting uh, Electra to essentially to improve a, an existing platform that they've been working on uh, to optimize the battery set, 
to optimize propellers, to improve their planning tools. So this is a project that's ongoing. And uh, I believe this aircraft will be doing some additional flight testing uh, next year for us. Very similar to the Sewell in some sense, has about the same uh, size, weight, and power, carries about 10 pounds. Uh, but we're obviously we're really excited to have the, the more platforms that are out there, the, 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 the more the whole community is being pushed up by uh, essentially engaging with the FAA, uh, getting more reasonable uh, regulations related to how we can fly these things. And it, and it provides competition. So that's, uh, let's go to the next one. It'll just I think it's a picture of their first flight. Yep. Just to give you a sense for the scale of these aircraft, you'll note on this one that they didn't put a full solar panel suite on it just because it was their first. Pro it was a prototype flight. Uh, in the future, you, the, the entire wing span would be covered in these thin film solar panels. Let's go to the next one. So this is the latest uh, cohort. Uh, we, we Instead of actually looking at platform development, um, in 2024, we released a solicitation that's actually looking at using these vehicles uh, to do flight or science demonstrations. And so we, we funded these three projects. Um, one, the first was in, in, led by Innovative Imaging and, and Research Corp, uh, some former NASA Stennis folks that have a spinoff company developing imaging spectroscopy. So they'll be flying on the Aerostar Thunderhead balloon. Uh, the SWIFT team came in with a, a, a proposal also to continue development of that platform and, and fly some additional instruments. And then uh, Spectral Science is incorporated. I think they're out in Boston. They uh, are planning to fly on the sky airship and they have a they have an imaging spectrometer as well so these are all in phase one uh, we look forward to uh, seeing their phase two proposals but these would be missions that would likely fly in the 26 to 27 time frame if you go to the next slide here i think we have a little bit more information on sky so this is a really exciting new airship that's under development out of roswell new mexico um, this is a material sciences company that developed a thin film uh, sh uh, material that reduces the um, reduces helium leakage from these uh, platforms by a thousand times. Um, helium is very expensive. It's very rare. And it's really been a, um, the inability of these shells to maintain the helium is it really drives up the price of operations of airships. So this is, is this was really a breakthrough uh, of having this material that's not permeable to helium. And so what it has enabled them is to scale up uh, these very large airships. Um, you may be able to see the people on the ground. They kind of look like ants down there because this is a this is a very large ship. Um, this is exciting to us um, for a number of reasons, but the, probably the most important one is it can carry so much more payload than these solar electric aircraft. And so we'll be able to distribute hundreds of pounds of payload uh, across a number of different locations on this and be able to take coincident measurements from different types of instruments. So you could have a, uh, a stereo imager and you could have a radar. And, and one of the things that we're really working on, as I mentioned for STV, is fusing that data together. So getting uh, coincident data collections is really important. And this is designed to stay up for six months at a time, if you can believe that. So we're really talking about a, a, a pseudo satellite, if you will, something that we can launch and take measurements for months at a time to watch processes uh, happen in real time and send that data down, but also have them deployed and ready should we have a disaster or something else that that really needs uh, high spatial and high temporal resolution. So more to come on this team. They just did their first uh, uh, fully autonomous uh, stratospheric flight just this year, and they have a bunch of more flights up coming up next year. So we're really excited to partner with them uh, through our SBIR program. All right, next one. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the payloads that the science payloads that are under development. Um, one of the criticisms that that there that has been levied against HAPS in the past is that oh great you can fly up there but there really aren't enough you know you have ten pounds or five pounds of payload how can we do any science measurements from that well you know I think the story of HAPS is a story of convergence of technologies as they mature so uh, back in the I guess 2015 time frame, we hit this important milestone for batteries where you can get 400 uh, watt hours per kilogram. That Hitting that point is what really made HAPS uh, able to do the work that they do in terms of uh, collecting enough energy, 
uh, to keep operations going, but then having enough cycles where they can continue the mission uh, day after day going through that nighttime cycle. Thin film solar cells uh, that are high, high efficiency yet lightweight um, with coatings that can collect data uh, or collect <laughs> um, photons at very low slant angles, lightweight materials, um, the drone revolution really commoditized uh, and miniaturized components like autopilots, inertial navigation units. And now because of things like the, the CubeSat community, we've seen a, a really significant miniaturization of payloads. So all of these things converge at this time uh, to make these things a reality, both in terms of their ability to fly, but also in terms of their ability to provide scientifically useful data. So we've been partnering with the USGS and Menlo Park to evaluate uh, a commercial imaging spectrometer from high specs in Norway. Uh, we first flew it on our ER2. Um, we have now flown it on the Sky HAPS airship just, a, just last month. And we're looking forward to flying it on the Swift Engineering Sewell uh, after it's finished with the Forest Service mission. Why are we doing this? Well, the NASA Surface Biology and Geology mission, will, which will be launching in only a, a few years here, I think 28 or 29, um, th that team is very interested in this technology. Um, as you can imagine, if you have an eight or 16 day uh, repeat, a lot of stuff happens with vegetation, for instance, in between those uh, uh, overpasses. And so during green up or green down periods or uh, drought, uh, significant uh, heat effects like we're having right now, where you actually want to watch uh, uh, the, the changes in vegetation and evapotranspiration, um, our hope is that this will provide yet another uh, uh, way to collect interesting chemist leaf chemistry information, water content information. Um, so, so stay tuned. Uh, we're really excited to, uh, uh, essentially we're going to make these, in, this instrument and the other, uh, one that goes out to the shortwave infrared, uh, we're going to make these available to the science community once we're done evaluating them. So these will essentially be facility instruments that'll be, uh, able to be used, uh, by NASA researchers. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is another small, uh, wide field of view thermal camera that's being developed under, uh, a phase two SBIR project. And uh, this is called T-Bird and it's a company called Xiomass who recently uh, uh, took over the Daedalus company, um, which has been working on uh, thermal imagers for years and years and years. But this is this will be a three band, uh, viz, uh, mid wave and long wave IR really tuned for fire detection. And it has the right size, weight and power that can fit on a, on a HAPS. If we go to the next one, uh, because of that, the successful nature of their phase two, they were awarded a, a, an SBIR sequential, which is a, a unique uh, opportunity that comes up uh, every few years uh, to take a phase two effort and ma further mature it. And so we invested, I believe, about $5 million uh, in Desiomass to develop a miniaturized version of T-Bird that they're going to call TMMS, as, so, and then as well as a, a 6U CubeSat uh, payload version. Uh, so you see to the right, um, if, you know, we're looking at potentially launching a constellation of up to 24 of these that would have uh, significantly better resolution than MODIS, but have a revisit rate that's much better than MODIS and a, and a similar swath width. Um, the, the hail version, as you can see to the right, would have a three meter pixel resolution, um, persistent coverage, and a, and a pretty wide swath of 57 kilometers. So these will be delivered to us in 26. And again, the, the intent is to make these available to the science community. And you can see the band combinations there too. That hopefully will allow us to get fire radiative power. Uh, that's a really important element of, of really understanding the combustion efficiency of fires, as well as the emissions output of fires when it comes to modeling uh, the, the, their impacts. Go to the next one. <laughs> This is another uh, Earth Science Technology Office funded instrument. Um, this one is more aligned with the planetary boundary layer mission. So the idea here is to have a, again, a one, uh, two or more of these uh, in, in, a, in a train that allows you to get uh, through parallax and through thermal imaging, uh, being able to track wind speeds and their altitude using particle velocimetry. Essentially looking at aerosol movement uh, with quick response imaging um, and so we're really excited about this one too it's the it's about uh, an eight pound imager 
And so we're, uh, we're, we're exploring flying this on HAPS as well, both for fire imaging as well as uh, atmospheric um, aerosol uh, analysis and uh, planetary boundary layer determination. Next one. This is um, a POPS instrument. I think most people have heard about these. These are aerosol uh, particle counters. Um, so we've been partnering with Frank Koich and John Dykema at Harvard, um, essentially to explore the use of uh, HAPS for uh, taking measurements of high altitude aerosols. So this team is actually gonna be flying on, a, on an Aerostar drift balloon, which just, it doesn't do station seeking, but it does provide, you know, uh, that vantage point, and it also is a, is a way to mature systems before they stay up for, you know, 60 to 90 days. So uh, this team will be flying along with Xiomass and their, their T-Bird instrument uh, to test a, a, a kind of payload for looking at the atmospheric impacts of fires. So they'll, you know, image fires and then look for uh, resultant aerosols that are transporting uh, from that fire. So uh, more to come on this one. We, we wish them the best during their flight this month. And then uh, this is small enough where we see this as a potential piggyback um, on lots of future missions uh, because of its very small size. Okay, the next one. I think this is one of the last ones I'll talk about. So this is a synthetic aperture radar that's being developed by Aloft Sensing. And again, this is funded by our ESTO program. Uh, the idea here is it's a very small X-band interferometric synthetic aperture radar. Um, what this will allow us to do is, is take really precise uh, topographic measurements, being able to detect change over time, whether it's from a landslide or post-earthquake deformation. And it's just got such a small form factor that we'll be able to put this on, on nearly um, all of the HAPs that I've talked about. The other really unique thing about this platform or this payload is that it provides very pr precise uh, navigation and timing. If you go to the next slide, you know one of the one of the things that's is is impacting science as well as our our defense department colleagues is GPS jamming and denial, and and it it stops missions. You know we we can't fly in some of these areas uh, throughout Europe now. There's there's a lot of areas that are blacked out because of the military operations going on. So. We see this as, as one of the ways to overcome that challenge is um, by flying systems like this that can provide an alternative means for giving you very precise uh, navigation and position uh, as you're collecting data. So it's just a nice, it's, it's kind of an, uh, uh, it's a consequence of what they need to do in order to uh, analyze their data anyways. They're able to use the data in order to provide very uh, precise uh, positioning. And you can see in the middle, um, you can see, I guess, the size of the payload. Uh, that's it integrated into that Swift Engineering nose cone. So you can see just how small this, this uh, hardware is. Uh, and you can see the contact information there if you want any more information from Aloft. Okay, and then I think the next slide. So the other thing that we've been looking at is uh, once you have these things up in the air, weeks at a time, you're going to want to optimize the measurements that you take. In order for it to be cost effective, you're going to want to collect as much data as you possibly can. Ideally, you have multiple payloads on board and it can be a multi-mission asset that can be tasked to do different things during its 30 to 90 to 180 day mission. So this is a group out of NASA Ames Research Center that does uh, sophisticated planning and scheduling for the International Space Station and all sorts of different science missions. And so we asked them to take a look at the challenge of providing planning and scheduling tools for HAPS. And so this is their first uh, uh, run at this. I think they're in their year three right now. And it's really looking at using HAPS to, uh, to look at atmospheric uh, sampling. Uh, we fully anticipate that follow-on studies will, will look at constellations of HAPS and how we can do a, a more efficient job of, of collecting uh, the most amount of science data as we can from these, uh, depending on what plat uh, what payloads are on board, what weather conditions are, are happening, what launch and recovery zones we have. There's a lot of different constraints that play into these. And so we really need uh, these types of tools to improve our planning. All right, next one. <laughs> 
great. So we're wrapping up here so that we can have time for questions. So, you know, th this is not an easy thing to do, working with these aircraft. Um, they're very, as, because they're very lightweight, they're very fragile. And so one of the biggest issues that we continue to have here is just uh, it really, uh, in order to do this right, we, you need to have really good uh, models of, of the weather and, and winds from surface all the way to 65,000 feet. Um, right now, we're essentially forced to, by regulations and by the, because of the immaturity of these aircraft, they're just not well characterized. We don't know all the, the failure modes. We don't know what they can and can't do. Um, we mostly are testing these in restricted airspace. And what that means is we have to have, uh, we, we launch in a column. It, it takes eight to 10 hours to get up. So, you, you know, you think about how often do you have a, a completely wind-free, pristine column from the surface of 65,000 feet? It doesn't happen very often. So that's a major constraint uh, to, to further developing these systems. I should note that that's really for the fixed wing solar electric planes. They, they operate under uh, part 107, which is the UAV rules. The balloons and the airship operate under part 101. They do not require a COA. They require that they notify the FAA when they launch that they have a means to track them and that they notify the FAA when they come down by deflating their balloon. So the airships and the balloons have a, a decided advantage right now in terms of their ability to access the airspace. The solar electric fixed wings are in, a, are in that UAV category. So you really need to build up uh, incident free flight hours to gain the confidence of, of the FAA and to, to bend the curve, if you will, of uh, there's a really big algorithm that goes into the safety assessment of these aircraft, but essentially you, you can't have a, a probability higher than one, one death in a million flight hours. That's, that's kind of the metric. And so really what that means is you have to have a lot of flight hours of safe operations to prove that you can fly into the national airspace system. So that's why it's very important that we're working with our colleagues and aeronautics research mission directorate to come up with more reasonable means of getting these aircraft safely into the stratosphere. Because once you're past the jet stream at about 45,000 feet, uh, it's, it's a very nice environment to fly. It just, it's just the challenge of getting through that, that uh, really high wind zone. Um, and then this shows some of the other, the other challenges, but I would say weather and airspace are, are, the, are the big challenges for us right now. All right, the next slide, I think that's it. So just in, in summary, um, NASA sees high altitude platform systems as a really important future component of our Earth uh, system observatory by complementing our satellite measurements with higher spatial and temporal resolution measurements. Um, we, I talked about some of the dem flight demonstration projects that we've already worked on, and I didn't complete that sentence, my apologies. Um, and then NASA uh, SMD ESTO is developing uh, some of the payloads and software that we, we are going to implement on these. And then NASA ARMD is furthering the development uh, through supporting the, the traffic management systems that are going to be needed uh, to employ these systems in the future for science and for civilian applications. And I think that is the conclusion here. So really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk with you about the, the work that we're doing here. And uh, let me know if there's any questions. Great, thank you so much, Matthew, uh, for that wonderful talk. So while I start looking at questions and preparing, let me ask one question really quick to you. If you could speak more about the optimization and the schedule planning. Uh, in particular, if you were to look for, let's say, optimization of number of balloons or optimization of revisit rate or optimization of balloon spacing, uh, could you speak more to those aspects and how that might be useful for um, different science objectives? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea being that you can have um, a constellation of assets that have the same payloads on board. And so in the case of the balloons, as I mentioned, there'll be times when the winds won't be where you want them to be. And so by having a constellation, you'll be able to essentially fill in gaps in your observations as the conditions change. Um, if you have systems with different types of payloads, for instance, you could have a interferometer that's doing an indirect uh, measurement of gases. And then you could have another uh, sensor that actually takes in situ gases. Um, so that there would be ways to essentially have these different assets uh, work together to improve uh, 
the observations of a specific phenomena. Um, so really what, I guess the hope for these sorts of tools, again, is that you, you it's a, it's, it's a process of working with the air vehicle teams to know what their constraints are and what constraints are driving their planning. And then from the science team, having a variety of different science targets, and then ultimately developing flight plans that take into account high level winds, cloud cover, um, and your, and the ability of the platforms to make those measurements, um, to, to, to collect as many observations as possible. So I think, you know, this one's just focused on a single platform as we move up in complexity with different types of platforms. I, I think you'll see that, uh, these types of systems will, will absolutely be needed in order to, to take the measurements that we need. Great. So I'm trying to find uh, questions in the Q and A. Are you able to see any of the questions, Matthew? I'm unable to see them while sharing the screen. Okay, I see a couple. Um, since many CubeSats have been developed by amateur radio groups at universities, is there interest in encouraging and funding such work? Absolutely. And that is why I brought up the uh, Flight Opportunities Program. I think the program is called Tech Flights. It's solicited every year. Um, and it's open to U.S. researchers, um, and, and that would be a great way. If, if you have a payload that's been developed, um, you, essentially, it used to be that under that program, you had a list of platforms, but now it's pretty much open. You can, you can essentially present uh, or propose to use any platform that you would like. So absolutely, I think it would be great to get, I mean, we, as I mentioned earlier, the, the CubeSat, both the, that the standards, are useful in this area, but also just the, the forcing function that CubeSats have had in miniaturizing all these subsystems. So I really see HAPS and CubeSats as going hand in hand. Okay, so let me see if there's another one. When do you anticipate the payload power consumption limitations of HAPS to ease given the convergence of technology? So um, good question. That's a major limitation, primarily for the fixed wing UAS. So that airship that I showed you, I want to say it has like uh, two kilowatts of power available. So there's le definitely less uh, limitations there. For the, for the solar fixed wings, um, it's, it's really about the power density of the batteries. As we go to 500 and 600 watt hours per kilogram, we'll be able to put less batteries on board to have more payload available or keep the same amount of battery mass and have more power available for uh, the payloads themselves. So I, you know, it, the, the development of batteries is, is happening very quickly. Uh, one company you might look at is Amprius. That, that's very popular in this community because they make very uh, uh, safe and effective uh, high cycle, high power batteries. Um, I guess the other very futuristic uh, technology that's being developed uh, by DARPA and the defense department right now is power beaming. Uh, so that would be microwave beaming of power to these vehicles. Um, so that would be uh, revolutionary in, in terms of being able to really have these up as long as you can keep beaming power to them. And so that will, uh, that will be a major breakthrough once they've uh, figured that out right now. I know they're just doing ground tests and fairly short distances, but that is uh, one of the technologies that will further uh, facilitate uh, long endurance flight. I have another question. Uh, if we go back to... You know, when you were showing, let's say the the flight track, um, you know, how quickly do you envision that these top systems will be able to adapt? Um, you know, you you mentioned different wind speeds, or or let's say there were solar panels um, that were powering it, and it had to adjust its altitude. Um, how how quickly can it adapt and adjust to these different environmental uh, conditions? Well, it, I mean, it's, I'm, I think they're getting a hundred Hertz measurements. I mean, so they're, they're continually adapting to changing wind conditions. So they, they have, a, you know, they're, they're, they're continually running this AI model to predict winds at all altitudes. And then they're taking in data from the platform as it's moving. That's essentially truth, right? Because you're not, it's not a powered vehicle. So when they're, as they're watching, uh, as they're taking data in the change of the position of the balloon, that feeds back into this AI-driven model to validate the wind predictions. And so the, it, the onboard autopilot is continually doing calculations uh, to figure out at what altitude it needs to descend or ascend to, to, to catch the directional winds that it needs, essentially the vector that it needs to carry it back to the area that it's supposed to be loitering over. 
so it's uh yeah it's it it it's very responsive and it's That's always really cool. as you can see here i mean you can you see the on the the top is like the view from above of where the where the balloon is going so it's zigzagging all over the place trying to maintain position so it can beam to a fire in that area and then you can see the strip chart on the bottom shows you the altitude changes over time so it's it's always moving up and down so that yeah. is a challenge for some observations right you're not at the same altitude all the time so that that is a consideration yeah, actually bringing up the measurement side of this. Another thing I was fascinated by was, you know, this measurement gap and the goal of have to fill this gap. When do you think this gap could be uh, filled by, and in, in, in particular to make these measurements that, that have this really important science implications? Well, so the STV mission, I think now is not launching any earlier than 2038. So, um, I, I, I'm very confident that we will have constellations of these vehicles up in the air by that time. Um, you know, that's partly what we're doing right now is really trying to exercise these vehicles uh, in restricted airspace to understand what they can and can't do. But as these systems mature, as the, the rules for the road mature so that it's easier to get these into the na national airspace system, um, the, these measurements are so valuable that I think we're going to see that it's, there, there's going to be a business case for keeping these things up, providing uh, measurements to to cities, to counties, to states, um, whether it's agricultural reports or it's disaster response or it's communications and telemetry. Um, I so if I had to guess, I would I want I want to say in, a, in about five or six years, we'll be seeing routine measurements from HAPS uh, in the stratosphere. That's very exciting. I do see we have another question uh, in the chat. So the question asks, given the thin atmosphere and extreme temperature fluctuations in the stratosphere, how significant are the cooling challenges for payloads and HAPS? And what solutions are being explored to address these limitations? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a really important part of this is, uh, is developing systems that can survive at minus 80 C. So there's a lot of time that's spent on environmental testing. So putting them in, the, in, a, in a pressure and temperature chamber and ensuring that, you're, um, that, that they survive. But there's a lot of um, packaging that you have to do for these instruments. And you have to have both uh, heaters and blowers. So there's times when you need to provide heat to the systems. But also because the atmosphere is so thin, uh, it's really hard to shed that heat. And so sometimes you need to turn blowers on to actually uh, uh, disperse some of the heat from some of the computers. So um, yeah, that's, it's absolutely critical that you have a payload that's survivable. And that means lots of testing and lots of engineering that goes into uh, assuring that you can keep it with, you know, within a, a, a temperature range uh, of about minus 20 typically C is what most electronics can go down to. Really cool. I see there's another question about, you know, if the slides presented today uh, can be shared. I, I wanna expand on that more generally, you know, if, if people are interested uh, in this type of work, you know, where, where do you recommend they go to see more of this? Uh, good question. So, um... The, the University of North Dakota has now put on two different uh, symposiums related to upper atmospheric um, work like this. It's called SOARS, S-O-A-R-S. So I believe, uh, so we just had one this year that I helped them organize. I think they're going to do another one in 26. Um, the, the European Space Agency has been putting on I think they put on three meetings so far that they entitled HAPS for ESA. So they just had one in the Netherlands in February. Um, I, I think if you, yeah, that's a good question though. There really isn't a lot of uh, conferences or workshops focused on HAPS at this time, um, just because it is so niche and it's there's not a lot of assets out there yet. But those are two uh, conferences that I think we'll be repeating over the years. Great, thank you so much for sharing uh, those opportunities and uh, suggestions. And then I um, left my contact information at the bottom there. Maybe if you oh, want to yes. scroll to the bottom, uh, definitely if folks want to uh, 
learn more about this or have ideas on, on using HAPS for your science, I definitely want to hear about it um, and, and want to help connect you with uh, these different platform teams if, if you're interested in writing proposals. Um, and, and I guess I should also mention that too, that definitely, uh, as I mentioned, NASA is investing in these. And so there are research opportunities through the NASA uh, Inspire system, Research Opportunities in Space and Earth Science. Um, it's a, it's a website and inspires. And so the, uh, I would keep an eye open for opportunities either for payload development or for flight demonstrations. Um, that, that would be another way to, to keep moving this, this technology forward. Great. Thank you so much. Well, again, here's Matthew's, uh, contact information. Thank you all for attending today's presentation. Matthew, is there anything else you'd like to add before we end today's webinar? No, thanks again for the venue. Um, really, really glad to join you and, and excited to uh, hopefully partner with some of you in the future. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and again for your excellent presentation. We greatly appreciate this. Thanks for having me, Sean. Bye, everybody. Bye.